As mentioned, I'm Anna Watt, and up until two weeks ago, I was working for Stanford University, uh, building accessible, user-centered websites and web products, so we supported the university's over 3,000 websites. We were sort of operated as an in-house Drupal web shop, um, and I worked directly with our development team, back-end, front-end devs, and visual and user experience designers. But I actually just started a new position just last Wednesday at a startup in Seattle called Textio as a community manager. But while I was at Stanford, I worked on campus for the first six months, and then I decided to move to Seattle, where I continued working for them remotely for the last two years. And when I moved, I was really missing that sense of community. So I started a Stanford community of practice for distributed and remote workers, which was a community that met entirely virtually to discuss this culture shift of the future of work and what that looked like, and specifically the challenges facing technology teams in higher education. So first, I want to start off by saying I am not here to push a remote first agenda. I know that there are some companies doing that really successfully, but really I want to help support the culture shift around what ro remote working really looks like and how you can work with a distributed team. In working in tech, you will inevitably end up in a situation where you're working with someone in a different physical location as you, even if that means they're in a different office or even a different conference room on another floor. And I encourage you not to just cancel your remote meetings because of that. <laughs> So, or your collaborative meetings, that is. So I have to tell you this talk is already going so much better than the very first talk I ever gave at a conference. I was introducing this new community of practice for remote workers at Stanford's ITN conference, which brings together 500 of Stanford's IT professionals from all across the university. I flew back to Palo Alto, California on campus from Seattle. And I'm originally from the Bay Area. So I said, oh, I'll just stay with my parents in Pacifica, which is this cute little beach town about 30 minutes away without traffic on a good day. So I gave myself an hour and a half to get there. And believe it or not, it took me an hour and a half to get there. And I was late to my first ever talk. Um, I got stuck in traffic. When I finally got to campus, I parked at the staff parking lot about half a mile away from the conference center. I had to book it across campus, hoof it up a flight of stairs, three stairs at a time, and I go busting through the conference doors to see my speaking partner on stage nervously laughing and introducing me. So I climb up on stage, out of breath, finish the talk, humiliated, but it turns out that Everyone thought that we had staged this, that this was this big scripted moment, right? Because the irony was that we were introducing this community of practice because so many people were dealing with their commute time, specifically at Stanford, they had doubled within the last year. Nailed that one. So I go busting through the door, they recorded it, I'd show you a video, but I'm not going to. Um, and the reality is that in San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm sure this is true in many other cities, San Francisco workers have quit a job due to a grueling drive to work. That's one in three San Francisco workers. And this came from a 2018 study by Robert Half, a talent firm. Yikes, I'm sure some of you can maybe even relate to this here. And it's not just traffic that's the problem. There's this affordable housing crisis happening in many major tech hubs. And I grew up in the Bay Area, my entire family is still there, but I personally made the decision to move so I could afford a home. And I knew that that was a decision was also a privilege that I had. And I know several other people that have made that same decision to move away from their family in order to afford a different lifestyle. And if you're having a hard time thinking about how remote working might impact you or your employers, I encourage you to check out this talk by Erica D. Fox. It's called New in Town. I saw this talk at the Right Speak Code conference in Portland, Oregon of August 2017. There's a link at the top, um, bit.ly link. But this talk confronts the impact of the tech industry on gentrification. And I can't do this talk justice, so I just encourage you to watch it after, um, you know, when you go back after this conference. And it really talks about that impact and specifically how remote working can help offset some of those issues along with other insightful research and ideas. So check that out. Because the other thing is, anytime you talk about remote working, the stigma is, this is what you're doing. <laughs> Maybe I'll be doing this in a few hours because we're here, but uh, realistically, this was not my life. This is not what it looked like to work from home. Somehow, you're on a beach, 
with Wi-Fi, maybe there's a cocktail. <laughs> but that certainly is not the reality for most remote workers. This is what my office looked like. I worked in my house between four walls from nine to five every day. That is my desk, and that is my huge cat, Lambert. He's part Maine Coon, <laughs> so he's just big. But if you zoom in, you'll see like I'm on Slack having a discussion about GDPR compliance, not looking up flights to Mexico with infinity pools and Wi-Fi to work from. And mad props to anyone that can do that. That's amazing. But I just found that it wasn't the lifestyle that I was able to live. Because I interacted with my team and our clients on an almost hourly basis on video calls all day long. This was my view, not the beach. <laughs> this is my team at Stanford on Halloween. No one tweet this slide. They know that I'm sharing it, but they'd probably kill me if they knew I chose this photo. <laughs> um, I didn't know, you know, if I didn't know any better, this could be any other day, but it was Halloween. Um, you'll see my coworker Carol is dressed as a chicken. She's actually holding a chicken. Um, and in the bottom left, you'll see is the conference room of people on campus. We had just as many people working on campus as we did working remotely. And we have everything from developers, designers, project managers, writers, um, user experience researchers, both remote and on site in this picture. We had a lot of fun. And every Monday morning, we'd all jump on a call in a larger team, have our stand up, talk about blockers, and really just kicked off our week. So, okay, I told the conference organizers there'd be pictures of cats, so, you know, that's why they picked my talk. But the truth is, I never thought I would be a remote worker. I was terrified. I, you know, I'm an extrovert. Working remotely was really hard for me. I, I get ideas from being around other people. So even though Lambert here and I can come up with great ideas together, such as napping on my keyboard, ultimately I still needed to join remote meetings with my team, and I still needed to collaborate. And as the project manager, people were looking to me to lead those in a collaborative way, just like when I was on campus for the first six months. It's just that now I'll happen to be floating up on a giant five-foot TV screen on the wall in the conference room. And so while you might think it's challenging, how do you run a brainstorm meeting without that whiteboard and the smell of dry erase marker, right? Um, I actually found that it's still very, very doable remotely. So today, finally, here's the plan. Uh, I want to discuss what exactly is a collaborative remote design working session, other than setting the record for the most adjectives used in a talk title. Um, and how is this different from just another regular meeting? And then we'll look at some tools we used and how I put them to use for running these working sessions entirely remotely, such as a virtual whiteboard, sticky notes and all. And then I'll share some tips and best practices for being inclusive, because all the tools in the world won't help you if you're not actually including your team. Sound good? Let's do it. So what's the difference between another regular meeting and a working session? In a traditional meeting, you might be updating each other, right? You get in a room, you talk about the work, you assign things, you update, and then you leave, and then you go work on it. So the PM is there, right? We're delegating tasks. Hey, front end team, you're going to go theme those responsive breakpoints now, yeah? Back end team, go do back end stuff. <laughs> And user experience designer, you're going to interview a user or something, right? And then we'll all come back together and talk about what we did wrong because we weren't actually working together. Go team. So this isn't just about having better meetings with your team. It's about changing the way you actually spend your time together and how you get that work done. So after this, you can go tell your team, guess what? No more meetings. And then come thank me because they're going to love it. By actually switching to the term working session, even in the calendar invite, I saw a change in the way people approached the time together. They felt less pressure to bring finished work to a meeting to share with the group, and we still have daily stand-ups and sprint reviews for those of you working on Agile teams and are curious. So these are working sessions outside of that. So what exactly is this collaborative remote design working session? Well, it's collaborative because no one single person is giving a formal presentation like I'm doing right now. This is not a collaborative talk. Uh, when people are co-creating and feeling included and their ideas are being heard, they're far more engaged. And they're not sitting there on their laptops looking at pictures of my cat. Um, your working session should be as hands-on and interactive as possible. And it's remote, so this is the tricky layer, right? What does it mean to be remote? It doesn't mean that everyone's working from home. It just means that you're not physically co-located. Maybe there's people in a different office or a different conference room across campus. This happened at Stanford all the time. It took 20 minutes for me, although 
30 seconds flat when I sprinted on stage super late to cross campus to another meeting. So we're saving time by just calling in remotely. And the goal here is that you're making the content of these meetings or these working sessions accessible, regardless of anyone's physical location, the day of the working session. So think about the time you called into a meeting on speakerphone, or you were the person on the laptop at the end of the table with everyone else in the room. You probably couldn't see the whiteboard with all of their fabulous ideas. You probably couldn't hear everyone that well. And when you did try to chime in, it was awkward, and they asked you to repeat yourself as if you just interrupted them. Sound familiar? Just didn't feel like you were there in the room with them. So when you set up these working sessions to work remotely, you're forcing the adoption of tools and best practices that make this content actually more accessible and inclusive for everyone in the room, even those physically there and remote on screen. And these are design working sessions because they use a design thinking process, which I'll cover in a few slides, which brings the team along the journey of designing something together. And when there's a shared decision making along the way, you no longer need to fill people in on conversations or decisions made without them. Oh, well, the design team met last week during our design review meeting and made some tweaks to those mock-ups after. I put a note in the JIRA ticket. Didn't you see it? Design is iterative, right? Things are constantly changing. So when you're making these changes and decisions together, no one gets left behind. And these are working sessions after all. They're not deadline-driven meetings, as I mentioned before. So people aren't rushing to get stuff done. And it allows the team to create shared goals and expectations for how they spend their time together. So we're taking a page from our accessibility advocates. Accessibility is huge in higher education, as it should be everywhere. So when you solve a problem for a remote employee, you often solve it for everyone. As a remote project manager, I was forced to keep up with documentation, define and redefine our processes, and over-communicate, because someone couldn't just walk up to my desk anymore. And sure, there's Slack, they can ping me, but it's just not the same. And when you're remote, you want to have access to that information as quickly and efficiently as possible. So when you set up these working sessions to provide all materials to work remotely, such as creating a virtual whiteboard, it creates a much more cohesive and well-documented experience. So raise your hand if you've ever had a magical brainstorm whiteboard session in a conference room and you took a picture of it. And guess what? I bet that picture is still sitting on your phone in a black hole. Or maybe you posted it on Slack and got a thumbs up emoji until one day Google Photos prompts you, hey, do you want to archive these 22 pictures of whiteboard photos? So with a virtual whiteboard, it can be revisited, modified, updated, and used frequently throughout the project without requiring someone to painstakingly transcribe all of your wonderful notes on sticky notes on the board. So this is an example of Mural, a tool that we use to recreate these virtual whiteboards and share a link. And I put a link to this whiteboard in every single one of my meeting invites, regardless if we're past the brainstorm phase or not, because we might come back to it, right? We might still want to access this information later. So as I mentioned, working sessions benefit from this design thinking process since you're bringing everyone along this journey of designing something together. The source here is the Stanford D School. They have several great resources for how to run workshops with this, lots of playbooks and sort of worksheets and stuff to walk you through how to do this. But I'm going to cover the quick basics because this could be its own talk. So just quickly. First, you want to empathize with your users. You want to understand how they're feeling. What are their motivations? Gain an empathic understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. Then you're going to define the problem or the hypothesis. So typically, you create a human-centered problem statement, which is really just a fancy way of saying, what are we doing here? For example, how can we use storytelling in a visual and compelling way so our readers will want to learn more and feel empowered to keep coming back to our website instead of, we want our users to click and read our magazine articles to drive up the number of page views. Then you're going to quickly jump into the idea phase with solutions and designs. This is brainstorm. This is where the magic happens. So you can include ideas for visuals, user experience, how you might talk to users, even ideas for infrastructure you think you might need to solve the problem. And then jump into the prototype, experimental phase. This is low fidelity designs, wireframes, whatever you need to get a prototype together so you can get it in front of users as quickly as possible for immediate feedback, which brings you to testing. 
And it's okay to fail fast because you're gonna keep going through each of these different stages as you learn more about your users' needs, how they're feeling, how they're thinking and behaving to your designs so you can keep improving. So I wanna share an example feature request of how we might have taken a feature request into a design thinking working session with our team remotely. So this example, the product owner came to us, we worked on websites at Stanford, a product owner came to us and said, as a content author, just someone that edits content on a website, I want to share the latest article with a video or a featured image on the homepage so that I can drive more traffic to our magazine articles. Okay, great. Let's get in a room. Let's talk about it, team. What are we, what are we, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Who are the users we're really solving this problem for? So first we empathize and define the problem. The end users, the website visitors, are the people we're actually designing for here. So you want to get everyone in the room thinking about those users right away, not just about the product owner's business needs, which we know are important since they're the content authors. But in our working session, we'll use these frameworks, for example. So this, again, we're using Mural because we're in that brainstorm sort of empathize and define phase. On the left, you see this uh, strategizer value proposition canvas. And what that is, is it's looking at your user profile, so understanding their gains, their pains, what are the tasks, the jobs they need to do when they get to your website, right? Everyone needs to do something when they're looking at your website. And on the other side, you're looking at your product, your service, or your website, and what are those gain creators and those pain relievers? And between those two canvases, you'll start to identify a fit where things are fitting between your users and what you're providing to them and where the gaps are. What are you missing? What are you not seeing? And that's how you start to define what are the problems we're really trying to solve here. So our user experience designer in this working session with this canvas, for example, in Mural, is getting the whole team thinking about the end user experience. We have developers in the room. We have, obviously, the user experience designer. Everyone's talking about this from the beginning. Um, and then on the right is just another example of the Lean UX framework that you can use to help define uh, the problem. So from there, you're going to get into idea mode. And this can happen in the same working session. Sometimes the last phase takes longer. It just depends how big the problem is and how much you already know or what you don't know yet. So in the idea phase, we use Google Draw or Envision Freehand, for example, to quickly sketch in low fidelity ideas. I don't actually have the mock-ups for this feature request since I no longer work at Stanford, but this is just obviously a picture of a white uh, wireframe. But our developers might start sketching in some ideas for functionality requirements as our designer is sketching out ideas for how they want this to lay out on the, the new homepage we're designing. Maybe our developer even says, oh, hey, I have this idea to use this YouTube API. And while they're demoing this, all of us in the room, we discover, oh, we want to use our own image stills and the ability to upload those instead of using the YouTube previews since we know that custom imagery is really important to our product owner. So we, you can see we're sort of discovering these things together collaboratively much earlier on in the process. Then we'll jump into our prototype phase, our visual designer. These, again, admittedly are much higher fidelity than where they probably started, but this is what I can share with you. So we're looking at mock-ups. They're using Sketch or Envision or Figma to collaboratively jump in and work on these designs. And we'll walk through these technical requirements with our developers. We'll confirm the user flow with our user experience designer in the room as well. And finally, we'll test. And in our next work working session, we'll jump on a call in Zoom to share our screens and watch someone test our prototype for the very first time. You can use tools like Optimal Workshop as well to send it out to like large groups of users to collect a lot of data. But the quickest way to just test is share someone's screen and watch them interact with your prototype for the first time. And in this case, I was the guinea pig, so I was the one testing our very first prototype. And on the right, there was no play button. Our designer immediately was like, wait, where's the video play button, this custom icon I created? It's missing. And as it turned out, Google Tag Manager was preventing our custom JavaScript from loading in the correct order. And so, you know, if anyone's come across that bug before, that was a fun one to kind of troubleshoot together. But we were able to really quickly uh, come across some of these issues early on and get them resolved because we were sharing our screens and not just like peeking over each other's shoulder at the other person's laptop. 
So, so far we've talked about the format of collaborative remote design working sessions, an example feature built in a design thinking process remotely. So here's some other tools because I've already mentioned a few. And chances are you're already using a lot of these, but I think, uh, but start thinking about how you can leverage them to set up a remote working session. So first and foremost, nail down your video conferencing software, super important. Our team used Zoom, Slack also has great uh, you know, video capabilities for ad hoc calls. Um, but we would actually set up a dedicated Zoom number that the team would just memorize and it kind of served as our virtual office to just, hey, jump on a call and then people would all meet there. So you don't waste time setting one up when you need to. Uh, we would also set up our conference room so that we did have whiteboards in the physical room directly across from the camera where the conference room screen was pointing. Um, and then we, I actually figured out, it's a little creepy, but you can change the settings of the Zoom host to allow far end camera control. So as a remote user, I could actually control the camera and like zoom into the whiteboard and look around, which was really empowering as a remote person. I don't have to interrupt someone in their idea because I can't see what they're doing. So I was able to kind of feel like I was in the room with them also. Other brainstorming tools, MindMeister is a good one for quick sort of mind mapping, just stream of conscious, getting ideas down. Uh, Trello is really great, another virtual sticky board-like experience with sorting and voting and commenting, and now it connects to Jira because Atlassian owns them now, so that's cool. Um, you can also use Mural and Optimal Workshop for user experience testing. Uh, Optimal Workshop has tree jack, card sorting, first click analysis, and surveys. Design mockups. Uh, we were using Sketch and Envision for a while, but Figma sort of taken over that real time collaboration sort of Google Doc experience for designers, which has been really great. So just take advantage of all of the tools your team is already using, but think about how you can use them in a more remote friendly way. And if there are others that you know of that I haven't mentioned, tweet them at me. Um, always, always checking out new tools. And so finally, as I mentioned, you can have all the tools in the world, but they're not gonna help you if you're not actually including your remote team members. So I have a few tips I wanna share with you. This first one, make remote working an option for everyone, especially for any managers in the room. This might be the hardest part, so maybe find me after if you find that this is the biggest hurdle on your team. But I call this out to managers specifically because I think the culture shift has to start from the top. Working from home should not be considered special treatment or a privilege. And I'm not saying everyone should work from home every day, but they should have the option and flexibility to work from when and where they need to. Only allowing full-time remote staff to work remotely creates this really negative stigma around it and resentment for those that do. So if everyone on the team has a chance to try it, it won't feel like this dirty little secret that gets taken advantage of when they finally get to work from home because they have a delivery at noon. But it also creates empathy for the on-site team for the remote team members. Oh, man, I finally got to work from home last Thursday. I didn't realize when I eat pretzels right by the microphone, that's all you can hear. <laughs> Number two, always turn on the video camera. Now of all the tips I'm going to share, I think that this one is the most important. You have to have video and everyone on the call has to do it. Because video helps provide visual cues, like I'm agreeing with you or I'm confused, please keep explaining that idea. Um, it really, those facial expressions are really helpful for staying engaged and feeling like your ideas are being heard. And headphones are essential for remote participants. I think that goes without saying, but um, it just prevents that sort of awkward audio gaps in feedback that you might get. So just get a nice pair of headphones with a mute button. And on the positive side, uh, one positive side effect of remote working I've learned is that it really flexes your active listening skills since you are more aware of when you're interrupting someone when you have control of your own mute button. Sometimes I need to remember that one when I'm in real life again with other humans and not just my cat. So number three, have as much visibility as if you were in the office. Do you say hello to your team when you walk by their desk in the morning? Drop a good morning message in Slack to say hi to your remote teammates too. Some people even let us know when they stepped away from their keyboards for lunch or when they're signing off for the day, but it's not a hard and fast rule, so there's no real pressure around it if you forget to. We still have daily stand-ups, and that's not just for Agile teams. So 
for those of you that aren't doing them, most of you probably are, but host stand-ups with your remote staff and on-site staff. So you can kind of check out, okay, who's working from where today, what are the priorities, and really just kickstart the day for your remote teammates. I know as a remote worker, that's how I kind of felt like I was at work, even though I was still in my own house. This is a fun one. You can create a team working agreement that really sets those baseline expectations and understanding of how you're gonna do work together remotely. Um, you can create this in a fun team bonding workshop using a design thinking process. Um, we came up with a fun team name in ours called Team Rational and Reasonable. We were working on a lot of legacy code, so that just kinda came up. Um, but you can discuss and decide things like, Slack is great, but when is it appropriate to use email? Maybe never. We add conference links to every single uh, meeting invite, regardless if we know a remote team member is joining or not, because you never know if someone's plans are gonna change and they're gonna work from home that day. So just having that video call link already in the invite just keeps things moving smoothly and doesn't feel like someone's inconveniencing you because they decided to call in. Another good one is if there are more than 20 or 30 replies in Slack thread, just hop on a call and hash it out. How do you get a hold of someone if something is urgent? Do you need their cell phone numbers? And if you do have a company-wide policy, just make sure that it's visible and well communicated to your staff. But I also recommend that give your team that space to create a working culture that's unique and best for them to kind of get down into the nuances of these things. So I have a recap of all of those tips available on a link at bit.ly slash remote dash tips um, on Medium, which just has all of these tips and a couple of others, but the really big takeaways from today are, remember, you're collaborating, you're not presenting in these working sessions. Be inclusive of all your team members, both remote and on site. Always use video, that one's a must. And this is a design thinking process, so just know that in the end, you're bringing all your entire team throughout that journey of designing something together. Thank you, and you can find me on the internet, or come find me to ask questions.